Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of our Aquarium Online Academy. My name is James. I work here in the Education Department at the Aquarium of the Pacific down in Long Beach. We have a bunch of friends helping us out today. You're going to get to hang out and work with us today, too. We're going to be doing a Draw With Us class. So make sure you have your drawing utensils and your drawing paper or whiteboard or whatever you want to draw on. Except the wall. Don't do that. Unless you can. We are going to be drawing some tide pools today. Well, Jen's going to be at the controls for all the fun pictures and videos we get to watch. And Kaya is on question control. If you have questions about the tide pools, feel free to text us right here at this number, 562-286-1838. And we'll answer your questions live on the air. Now, if you're watching when we're not live, you can email us. We still have an opportunity for you to answer que or ask questions. We'll answer them. After we air live, or if you want a really extensive answer to something, e use the email down here, live at lbaop.org. Okay, so what's a tide pool? I'm glad you asked. Well, let's take a look at some tide pools real quick. If you've never had a chance to go down to the coast during a low tide, it's a lot of fun. If you get an opportunity, I highly recommend it. You gotta kind of check the clock though because it's not set every day. So this is a flyover along our rocky coastline here in California. And you can see on the rock wall, the difference in color here is the difference in the high and low tide zone. So the tides are controlled by the moon. And as the moon moves around the earth in comparison to the sun, we get different height of tide. The gravitational effect of the moon pulls the water to one edge. And that's how we get tides. Well, right here, you can see that there's this exposed area. So this is during a low tide and things happen that are pretty cool and pretty interesting. Things get exposed. That's okay. She went back to the studio. Things get exposed that you wouldn't otherwise see unless it's a low tide. So we're going to take a look at some of the animals that are there and we're going to get a chance to draw them too. That's great. So we can learn and draw and have a whole lot of fun this morning. Okay, let's take another look at a different angle. So before that was just like a helicopter flying over our tide pools. Now we're looking down at our tide pools. But what's in a tide pool besides water? What is this stuff you see here? There are seagrasses. You have to go a little bit lower than this in the tidal height line to find some seagrasses. But there are seagrasses here. In these pools are little tiny creatures that... That's where they live. They stay there the whole time. And when the water goes way down and leaves just a little pool behind, they have to be able to survive that time of when there's not a lot of ocean around them. We saw the wave action in there too. So they have to survive waves crashing against them. The sunlight is hot on them. Or if it's at night, because low tides can happen at night, it's really cold. So they survive temperature fluctuations that they don't otherwise get to see or experience in the ocean waves crashing on them it also gets kind of salty if there's a lot of evaporation going on the water gets saltier like the at sea salt strain into a space it's warm fresh water evaporates leaves the salts behind Not as, as extreme but the water evaporate and it leaves the salt behind so the water gets a little saltier throughout a uh, low tide. So there's a lot that they have to survive in. Well, let's start trying to figure out how we're going to draw this stuff. Let's go to, I think we have a picture of one of our tide pool habitats that we can show you that is inside the Aquarium of the Pacific. And it's one of my favorite spaces to talk to guests at because the guests that are there, when everything's working like normal, we can have people touch the animals in there too and experience what a tide pool might look like. So, a tide pool is when the tide goes down, leaves a pool of water, and we get lots of little creatures that that's where they stay and live. So Jen's going to pull up a tide pool picture for us. I think Kaya's writing down a question already. Get those coloring utensils ready. We're going to try and take a look and draw some stuff like this. Now, what animals do you recognize in our tide pool habitat? We have... Lots of fun stars all over the place. We've got anemones. What is this thing? This looks like a ball. I see it now. See this little space in the middle? Anemones, when they're out, they got their tentacles going, and then they can curl all their tentacles in. And that's how they protect those tentacles 
when they're either digesting food or sometimes during a low tide, they pull all their tentacles in because they need to save all the water they have inside their body so it doesn't evaporate, so they don't get dehydrated, just like we can get dehydrated. Now, I noticed something right there. What is that? Those are clam and mussel shells that we feed to the other animals. But they might live in some tide pools too. Now, underneath our question box right here, anybody else? Oh, there's one over way on the right side. These are urchins. We'll get to draw some urchins too. Oh, so we found stars in our pool, sea stars. Why don't, why don't I call them a starfish? Hmm. Do they look like a fish? Do they swim like a fish? No, they, they live in the ocean like fish do. And it's okay if you call them starfish. We're going to put our science caps on. And we call them sea stars because they're not really fish. Just like sea anemones live in the sea. They're not like other animals. They're sea anemones. So we have sea stars, sea anemones, and <gasps> sea urchins. It's a common theme when we're in the ocean here. All right. Let's go over to our drawing board and let's start drawing a tide pool. Now, you can draw your tide pool however you like, but you can follow along as I draw our tide pool here. Now, I'm going to draw a tide pool from the side. Let's see if I can angle this better. Mm. Trying to get that reflection off of there. All right. That's better. Now, here's my marker. We're going to draw on, I have a whiteboard here. Now, what I want to draw is not a tide pool from, woo, the top down, because that's a little bit harder to do. I'm going to draw my tide pool from the sides. So what we're going to have is we're going to make like a nice big canyon wall. Now, your, your tide pool walls can be as steep or shallow as you want. I'm going to make, oh, let's make some with steps coming off the sides. Rawr. It's rocky. It's got to look all rocky and rough, right? Right. All right. So now that we have our rock wall, should we, should we add where the water line should be? Yeah, let's add where, that, that gives us an idea of where the top of the water is supposed to be. And you can draw some squiggle for your water. It could be totally flat. Maybe there's no wind, no splashing. Your water's totally flat. Or maybe you want to draw little waves and ripples in it too. Now, I don't know what's going on there, but that's okay. If we make mistakes, that just makes it part of the art. It looks beautiful no matter what. Okay. So we should add some animals to our rocks, shouldn't we? Yes, we should. Let's start with something. Ooh, let's start with a sea star. Okay. Where should sea stars be? Now remember, even this backside right here is part of the wall. Imagine if you're looking at a bowl that you cut halfway into. So if you have your bowl right here, right? You cut half of it off, you look at the side of the bowl, you can still see the other wall of the bowl, not just the bottom of it. So we can draw stuff on that back wall right here. I'm going to draw my sea star back there. Okay, here's where I'm going to start. Now, you can try and draw sea stars the way I do, or you can do the way that we learned how to draw stars way back in the day where you do one of these. Oh, yeah. Now we got a sea star. You can color your sea star in. You know what? I have some colors that I'm going to start with because it's easier with my expo board. I'm going to just draw a nice, beautiful red and black sea star. Very, very colorful sea star. Woo! See, when you color it in, all those lines in the middle, they don't matter. They got they got overtaken by the rest of it. If you want to try a super bumpy, bulby star, I'm going to draw each arm individually like a flower. Now, you don't have to draw a flower like Star With Me, but I'm going to do it. Oh, I can't see the rest of that arm. It's hiding behind the rocks. That's okay. It doesn't have to be able to be seen all over the place. We have a nice, nice, big, bumpy star right here. I'm going to add some freckles to it, too. We'll take a look at some of those sea stars again while you catch up so we can show you all the bumps they have. So while you're drawing your sea stars, let's take a look at some real stars that we have pictures of. 
I surprised Jen. She wasn't ready for me to switch. <laughs> ah, sea stars. Do all the stars look really smooth and shiny? Not really. Some of these bat stars, they kind of look like that red one I colored in, right? Yeah. These other ones, they actually are nicknamed knobby stars. Knobby, like bumps on their body. Sea stars are really special. Their face is underneath them. If your hand were a star, the mouth would be in your palm and sit like that. And where is their feet? Well, if you're on the floor, where do your feet go? Do your feet stick up in the air? Only if you're rolling around. <gasps> Maybe your feet point down. So all of the feet of a sea star are also underneath. That's pretty cool. All of these bumps that you see aren't feet. They're actually bony parts of their skin. So they have the same kind of material as our bones, but it's in their skin. So it's not really a skeleton. It just gives them armor. So they're really strong in those tide pools. Remember, tide pools are tough to live in. Lots of splashing, lots of temperature change. The thing we forgot to talk about is predators. What would eat a sea star? It doesn't look that tasty at all. Seabirds will. Ooh. So a bird gets to see the tide pool and low tide. Like, ooh, that's a new space I don't usually get to hunt in. There are birds that will actually pull up the sea stars and eat them. That's kind of interesting because they're not easy to pull up. This is kind of like what we're drawing right now. This is a side view into a tide pool see how we have the back wall right there we can draw some fun animals on oh hello little fish yeah there's fish in tide pools too maybe even an octopus one day hmm. so look at oh actually you can kind of see the little feet on a sea star right there it's on the window that's pretty cool i think jen's gonna try and find more images of sea star feet so that we can do. but this is a great example of what a tide pool looks like now, while you're catching up with your sea stars, even if you didn't add freckles to your sea star, that's okay. You don't have to. So here's a great view of a bat star. There's the little feet. They're called tube feet, not tuba. Tube, T-U-B-E, like a tube. Tube. And they're like little straws with sticky ends that they can suck onto the surfaces. And when they walk, all the little feet just kind of do this. Have you ever seen like a millipede walk? It's not quite as fancy, but they use multiple feet at a time and they pick different ones up to walk around. So that's how sea stars get to walk and stick to surfaces. They're actually pretty tough to pull off of a wall. You have to surprise them. Now this is also a sea star walking on the sand. There are sea stars that are like sand stars that have specialized tube feet to go around in the sand. And they have these other little pokey parts to help dig themselves into the sand. So they can hide under the rock wall for them to sit on most of the time. They have to be able to survive in a coral habitat where it's really sandy versus really rocky like our kelp forest habitat. So in different habitats, sea stars look really different. All right, did you catch up with all your sea stars in there? You could have added more sea stars than I put. I kind of ran out of space. My sea stars started real big, but that's okay. It's going to be a really, really fun looking tide pool just like this. What else should we add to our tide pool? Hmm. These things right here, anemones. You want to add some anemones? All right, let's add an anemone or two. So. I'm going to quickly add all the freckles to my sea star. Woo! Sea star freckles. Okay. Where should we put an anemone? Since I drew a bunch of stuff over here, I'm going to add my anemone on this side. Now, this time I'm going to make it sit on the bottom. And it's kind of like drawing a big cylinder. So a cylinder is this shape. Whoop, like a toilet paper tube. Whoop. That's a cylinder. So it's got a circle top and a circle bottom. We can't quite see the other side. And then it's long, like a tube. So that's a cylinder. We're going to draw one of those right here. So now we add this part 
And I'm going to very lightly do this one because I'm going to draw a whole bunch of tentacles over on this side. So that way I know where I want my tentacles to stick up. Okay. Tentacles can be really thin little lines or you can make them really thick tentacles. I'm going to draw thick squiggly tentacles. Ooh, okay. Squiggly, squiggly tentacles. Now, we drew all these tentacles and I got this part here. I'm going to draw some more around the bottom. So those tentacles are all over. They have a lot of tentacles. Now I'm drawing my tentacles real quickly. You can catch up with me. Let me draw the mouth and then we'll take another quick look at anemones. So the mouth is right here in the middle. Almost looks like a little belly button. I'm just gonna make a little circly dot. That's gonna be our mouth. Now I'm going to color mine in real quick too because why not? I want to make mine purple. I don't know of any purple anemones, but you know what? It's art. We can make it what we want it to be, right? That's how art works. A little bit of purple, which shows up extremely dark on here, but that's okay. Remember, it's art. It's what we want. A little bit red. You can color yours however you want to color yours because the coloring is totally up to you. Now, we have our wiggly squiggly anemone. Let's go take a look at a real anemone. Ooh. That's just like what we drew. Yes. Wiggly tentacles. A little belly button mouth in the middle. And this one is red. This is called the fish eating anemone. It does actually eat fish. The bigger and fluffier the tentacles are on an anemone, the bigger the food is. It's kind of like... If I had very small hands, I might eat a small cheeseburger. If I had big hands, I could eat a big cheeseburger. Really tasty. So the bigger their tentacles are, the bigger their food can be. Some anemones, like the, even the giant grains, which are giant, they're big, they have much shorter tentacles, so they can't eat as big of a thing. And that's okay. The tentacle tells you that they might be eating something different sized. And in the middle, that's where the mouth is at. Remember where the mouth of a sea was? Underneath. Well. An anemone is almost the opposite. They stick up like this. They don't have any feet, but their mouth is in the middle right there. Now, the cool thing about anemones is that they can eat whatever they want. I wish I could do that. I would like to eat whatever I wanted. The challenge, though, is that there's not too many anemones that walk around. If you're an anemone, you don't just be like, whoop. If you did, that might take a week because they move. They're very, very slow. But there's, most of anemones not moving anywhere. One kind of anemone does swim. Now, you might have seen Jen's swimming anemone dance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They actually pop themselves off and they can swim away from a predator. Their predators are also very slow, so it's not like it has to be very fast. But they can move away. So most anemones stay put. They have a nice little foot called a pedal disc, a foot circle what it means they stick to a rock and they can stay there and they have to wait for food to catch them somebody somebody wants to draw a fish in our exhibit well you challenged me because i am not good at drawing fish but we're going to do our best and i'm going to help you draw a fish okay now anemones get to eat whatever they want here was the challenge if you're stuck right here you have only as far as you can reach you have to wait for food to get into the danger zone to eat it if it doesn't get this close Remember, you're not going to be like, now I can eat it. They don't chase their food. They wait for food to come to them. So that can be tough because not always does food get close enough because a lot of animals know these are sticky, stingy tentacles that might get them stuck or hurt, and they don't want to do that. So that is how the anemone survives in its habitat. Well, you saw that painted greenling in our video of a tide pool. We, we can try and draw it. I told you I'm not great at drawing fish. Your fish can be whatever fish you would like. But I can try and draw the greenling. All right. Remember, it's okay if the art isn't perfect. Here is a greenling. It's got this really fun camouflage. Can you find all of the sides of the greenling? I found the eye. Where's the rest of the fish? Oh, there's a fin. 
There's the tail. And there's the spiky dorsal fins. Okay, now I see it. Sometimes animals have patterns on their body that makes it tougher to see the shape of them when they're hiding. That's exactly the camouflage that we use, that we copied from them. So if you wear camouflage, it's designed to make it, you don't look like a person anymore. You just look like a thing against the surface. And the, the animals or things or even people can't even tell where you are because your shape no longer is the same. So that's pretty cool. There's our painted greenling. This one's going to be a fun challenge. You want to try? Okay. Now, greenlings, like other fish, have kind of a football shape. Here's my eraser. So when we want to draw a football, we do something that's like this, almost like the shape of an eye, right? This we call fusiform. Well, a greenling has even more long of a football shape. So let's see what we can do with our greenling. Okay, I'm going to use this corner because it gives me, I think, the most space I have in my art. And I'm going to start with a really long football. Maybe the football is just deflated. That's what happened. The football lost air. Okay. Now I need to add the tail. So I'm going to try and copy as much as I can from that picture of our greenling. It's got a nice little triangle paddle-like tail. A nice big eye right here. Whoop. And it's got a fun little mohawk style dorsal fin. And a second one right here. My marker is kind of thick, so my lines are getting smooshed together. But that's okay. Remember, it's art. It's whatever you want it to be. And then it had, like, stripes down the top. So I'm going to switch to a different color so I can just color it automatically. And like, whoop, whoop. I like making sound effects when I draw. If you don't, that's okay. This is just how I do it. I make sound effects while I go. Whoop. So there's our stripes. Now you can color, you can draw each individual line for your stripes and then color it in later. Since I had this nice big marker, I could have done it right away. Now I'm going to add the side fin, the pectoral fin right here and the cool thing about their pectoral fins is that they are strong enough that they can kind of stand on them so this green link would actually stand in an anemone what that what that but i thought you said those are stingy tentacles what well what's going on is it has the same relationship that a clownfish does do you remember nemo the clownfish well, clownfish live in and around anemones. They have a special mucus coat on their body. It's like a special suit of armor that allows them to sit in anemone tentacles. Well, they're not the only ones that figured out how to do this. They're pretty smart, and they're the most famous at this. But the greenlings, they can do it too. So our painted greenling will sit in among the seaweed, the kelp, and sometimes sit on top of anemones because they have a, a similar mucus coat to the anemone. They all have kind of boogers on their body. <laughs> Only the fish get to do that. And it helps protect them from the anemone. So we don't always get to see them because they're hiding. They're not as flashy as like, I'm an anemone fish in an anemone. They like to hide in the kelp forest. So they aren't as easy to spot, but our greenlings do that. So if you're trying to figure out how I would say that word, if you wanted to spell it, spell the word green, G-R-E-E-N, and then add L-I-N-G at the end, greenling. That's a greenling, this fun animal right here. All right, we have a few minutes left. We should draw something fun. Someone wants a sea cucumber? Kaya wants a sea cucumber. Jen second in the motion. The motion is carried. We're on. I'm going to make a sea cucumber. Where should we make a sea cucumber? Now, I stepped off the screen because I want to make sure we can get our sea cucumber done before time runs out. This is a sea cucumber. This is our drawing. Okay. Where should our sea... Oh, I accidentally erased part of my rocks. Ah! I got to put it back. 
Oh, we should make it climbing out because it's it's being goofy and wants to get out of the water. Okay. So a cucumber is just going to be basically a cucumber, right? Nice big cylinder looking animal. And it's going to be a little spiky. Just like Jen showed us. Spiky little cucumber. And it has little tiny feet down here too. Now because it kind of drew it floating a little bit. Actually, it's touching the rocks right there. That's okay. But I can add a fun little uh, helper rock. Yeah, these are helper rocks. It helps it get up. And it can they can kind of climb out. They don't typically like to climb out of the water, but they will. And they are related mostly like sea stars. Well, how does this spiky cucumber looking thing look like a sea star? Well, they kind of don't, but they have the same kind of feet and they have similar anatomy inside. So that's one of the cool parts about being a sea cucumber. They're related to sea stars. Oh, well, that's very fun. Is there anything else we should add to our little tide pool? Now, if you want, you could add more coloring around the rocks or more other animals here. I'm going to draw a real simple animal real quick with my big purple marker. Remember who was purple in, in, in our little tide pool habitat? This one. So we need to draw a pokeball, not a pokeball, a pokeball in our habitat. Now it's sitting on a piece of seaweed because they, they eat seaweed. So you can do it like this, where you just kind of draw a bunch of spikes sticking up. And you got a nice little cu uh, sea cucumber, not sea cucumber, cucumbers over there. This is a sea urchin. You have a nice little sea urchin right here. Or you could draw one. I'm running out of space. You can make the ball of the cucumber like right here and make real long spikes sticking up because there's some big urchins out there that have lots of spikes and some little urchins out there that have little spikes. There's a bunch of different kinds of sea urchins. So we drew purple sea urchins because they're actually purple urchins, like the picture we showed you right here. They get the easiest names. They're named after their colors. Scientists were very smart in that. There's the purple urchin, the green urchin, the pink urchin, the black urchin, the red urchin, and then they came up with more creative names. So there's a lot of urchins that are just named after their colors, which is great because that's really easy to pick out. Some urchins are not like these, where these have really skinny little spines. Some urchins have spines as thick as your fingers. It's called a pencil urchin. It's a tropical urchin. They look really, really cool. There's other urchins that look like they lost all their spine. Well, urchins come in a lot of different shapes and sizes, just like all the animals and all the plants and all the different algae. So there's a lot of variety, not just the exact same style like this. So however you drew your urchin, you drew an urchin. That counts. All right. Now this seaweed we see right here, this grows near the tide pool. Not always in the tide pool because it's, it can't really get exposed too much of the day to the hot sun. But near those tide pools, you'll get seaweed beds or algae beds where this giant brown algae can grow. And even though this looks kind of green, the three kinds of algae that we kind of group them into are the reds, the greens, and the brown algae. So they have different colors in their body, just like there's different urchins with different colors. And that's why we grouped them together that way. The brown algae get to be the biggest. Like this one is called macrocystis. Really big. And it lives right here in California. There's a lot of spaces in the world that algae can grow like this, but it has to be a very special habitat with cold water, lots of nutrients in the water, and kind of a rocky coastline because it can't really grow in the sand. It has to sit on a rock. So some places in North America or South America or Europe or Africa or Australia have it, but it's not quite as widespread as a coral reef. So seaweed and algae beds are special, just like our tide pool habitats. Here's what giant kelp or giant seaweed looks like. Well, we a time. I hope you had a lot of fun. You can keep adding stuff to your tide pool. Maybe your tide pool is not quite as full as mine like this one is, and you have space left that you can add stuff to. Well, keep having fun with your drawings and learning today, but we really love to see your pictures. You don't have to send us pictures of your art, but that's one of our favorite parts of the day. Kaya says you really, really should. 
Text us pictures of your art today so that we can see how much fun you were having while we were drawing and learning about tide pool animals. Well, we have a lot more fun going on today, so keep watching our Aquarium Online Academy, but also always have fun learning because that's really the best part about what we do here is we have fun while we learn. Well, enjoy the rest of your Thursday, everybody. We'll see you next time.